Okay, ladies, salam alaikum. Uh, good morning from Palestine, Gaza, the Islamic University of Gaza. We continue our uh, uh, English poetry course at the Islamic University English Department. Uh, next week is the midterms, so let's do some uh, kind of review. But before we do that, I want to go uh, again, just very quickly, preview the two poems we uh, discussed last time. Remember, when you approach a poem, you have to do it strategically and systematically. You could use whatever approach, whatever uh, uh, system, whatever approach, what, whatever you like. But at the end of the day, you need to give me some kind of comprehensi comprehensive reading of the poem. I personally like to start with the little things so I can build a case, build a pattern out of this, the things that the poets uh, give us. There's always this question of authorial intention, whether the author intended something or not. We don't care about this because the poem, language, poetry, literature, they are bigger than us. The more Com like uh, pervasive than us, than even the writers. And there's this theory that suggests that once the author, once somebody publishes a text, it no longer becomes his or hers because this person, this author, writer turns into a reader. So don't, you know, try to uh, uh, seek what the author originally intended. So sometimes we deal with the poem and try to see what we get from this. And because this is sometimes, you know, with the different approaches, uh, for example, the reader response uh, theories which would, would suggest that there are as many meanings or interpretations to a text as there are readers. This is good. I always encourage you to give me your opinion to see how things uh, are, are said or done. But in order to make balance, we try to look at the text itself. And this is the most significant thing to me. This is how I like to do things. This is how I like to appreciate literature. Studying the structure, studying the form, studying the language, the word order, which could be called the uh, close reading uh, approach, where you try to see the beauty of how words can do magic, how changing the word order, how changing, replacing one word with another can create a fascinating metaphor or particular sound pattern or uh, anything like we, we studied many, many, many times. That's why you, so I know some of you would hate it when I just say, why is this stressed? Why isn't this stressed? Why is there a perfect time, not a perfect time? In, in, in my thinking, this is uh, a more beautiful approach. It helps you to, to appreciate language and literature. It helps you uh, dive deeper and deeper into language itself. Because I believe that uh, themes are, like there are a handful of themes out there. What Romanticism, mainly it's about what? Anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment, na nature, poetry. Isn't that it? Childhood, right? Innocence. Right? Innocence, countryside, impact of nature on us. So if you study 100 poems for William Wordsworth, and at the end of the day, all you look for is nature, 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 isn't that repetitive and boring? But look at how he does different things sometimes to get to the same theme, the same objective. And I mentioned this last time. If, if poets believe that uh, it's all about the theme, they could have stopped writing poetry centuries ago. Because why would I write a new poem since there is another love poem that exists already? Why, why, don't, why, wouldn't I, why don't I borrow the poem and that's it, that's fine. Everybody is different. Everybody is, 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 is amazing in, in his or her different uh, uh, way. And I quoted somebody who told a critic, uh, I have so many ideas, I want to write poetry. Because we think, we do this sometimes. Wow, I have, I'm reading these books, I'm you know, listening to these uh, speeches or talks or TEDx or whatever. And then like, you feel that 
you are inspired because you have so many ideas. And then the man said, poetry, my friend, is made with words, not with ideas. And I connected this with even Coleridge's definition of poetry, uh, that poetry is the best of words in the best order. So there is always this deliberate conscious attempt to choose. Doesn't mean like the best, the most beautiful, the biggest, the most difficult. The, the, the word that is suitable for its context. For, for example, with John Donne, remember we, 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 before John Donne, during John Donne, the neoclassical and Augustine poets, they were speaking about the lofty subject matter and the lofty, elevated, highly sophisticated uh, diction. This has to uh, be balanced. Now, when John Donne wrote differently, used different language, different, you know, the conversational tone and everything, he was accused, in many books, if you open the books, you'll see them describing John Donne's language as vulgar. And I don't think la John Donne's language is vulgar. It's just that people were not used to using this language in this particular way. It doesn't, make it, it doesn't mean it's not poetic. It doesn't mean it's the wrong. But for them, it's the wrong language. Because when you talk about God, how would you talk about God and say, like what he did, for example, batter my heart, three person, God, ravish me, and these phrases and giving orders to God. Or death, be not proud. When he, we see, we, we saw, like spit in my face, ye Jews, with the, one of the sonnets. This is vulgar for so many. But for John Donne, this is the most suitable language. This is the best of words. Unlike Trump, of course, who has the best words, who claims to have the best words. So when you look at this poem, we, 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 we try to make sense of the form, of the shape. We said this is a short poem of four stanzas. We count the lines, so try to see, is, is he creating a, a perfect structure or not? And then uh, in poetry, we always have this. So one, two, three, four, five. Six, right? Six lines, six lines, six lines, six lines. We examine the rhyme scheme and we realize that uh, stanza, stanza one, stanza two, and stanza four have perfect rhyme schemes. The same regular uh, perfect rhyme scheme except for stanza number three. Number three. We here we take a note because there could be something. If there is any imperfection or uh, a stanza that has or a line that has an extra syllable or two extra syllables is usually something the poet is trying to draw our attention to. Like he's telling us, slow down here, I'm sending you a, a message. Of course, people who don't study poetry will not pay attention to these things. That's why it makes you special, makes you different. That's why I always say this, so those who study English literature and English poetry um, become the best translators and the best writers and the best journalists because you understand these tiny, differences where people never pay attention and you just wait a minute. The other, um, some time ago a student came to me and said, I met a student from another university and I discussed with her, we spoke about poetry, she's studying poetry, I'm studying poetry and she was amazed at how we do things and how beautifully uh, different we are. And I hope this is going to make a huge impact uh, on you. So, uh, uh, a poet, like, we, I remember we said the theme, so for example, we understand that this is a romantic uh, text. We understand, if, even if we don't know, in the, in the final exam you will have an unseen extract from a poem you didn't study. Unless you like, really read a lot of poetry and you, 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 you come across. And it's your job to try to tell whether this is probably romantic or metaphysical or 20th century or war poetry or Shakespeare from the, 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 the sensibility, the features, the form, you know? So if you study this poem, this is a pure nature poem, right? Yeah. Is he saying at the end of the day, for example, and, and these uh, daffodils look like your cheeks when you eat pizza? He's not using this whole scene just as a, some kind of decoration to make a point to etc. He's writing this for nature inspired by nature, to nature. And we, we've, we've seen at the end how he submitted himself totally to nature. Okay. Uh, now, we paid attention to little things that I consider to be huge, like a poet could not but be gay, and the ending line where we have a stress on a word that normally shouldn't be stressed, and we connected this with the theme of, of the poem. 
if you would read it with and, dan and dances with the daffodils or and dances with the daffodils in this stressed uh, way, indicating the emphasis of this word being the key issue in the whole, being the theme of the poem. This is about withness melting in nature, adopting, I don't know if adopting is the right word, but submitting yourself to nature, allowing yourself to be controlled and overwhelmed by nature, not the other way, the other way around. Now, and then I spoke a little bit about this fascinating poem. Remember the first thing that we look, it's a, it's a short poem, and then we count the lines, 14 stanzas. Some of you might be uh, surprised because, wait a minute, didn't you, some of you say the best definition for poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions recollected in tranquility? And probably it, it's, it's still, it is still is. And now, when we realize that this is a sonnet, and then we examine it and we understand that this is a Petrarchan Italian sonnet with an A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D rhyme scheme. If you count the, the syllables and you realize that they're all 10 syllables, five feet each, except maybe this one, unless, remember we said, and, and all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. If you, I'm not sure if the original manuscript, if it just removes the, you know, sometimes the apostrophe instead of one syllable here, the apostrophe, the, the schwa. So if you could still say, and bright, uh, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air, if he meant it this way, it means that 10 syllables, five feet each. I think this, remember the sonnet, the most rigid form of poetry, the most highly structured. Don't tell me people write, even Shakespeare, with all due respect. Don't tell me Shakespeare doesn't, you know, you're just here. He's inspired, he writes the, the sonnet and just, that's it. Should be here. He pushes a little bit here, he removes here, he places here, something. And even here, look at this, for example. Remember, silent, it should be silent and bare. Intentionally removing the and. The sun, intentionally removing the. the. I look at here, here, say, no, but not near ne here or here. Why? Because he wants this to be. So this goes against the spontaneity that he calls for. Is spontaneity a myth? Is spontaneity a myth? I mean, like even the title here, what does the title say? It says, composed upon Westminster Bridge. I don't think he wrote it on the bridge. But he was inspired there. Or maybe, we, uh, I wanted to post a meme uh, the other night. I probably do it today with, you know sometimes how on social media, when you reply to people like, ha, 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 or the smiley faces, but in real life you're like, yeah. yeah. So probably this man is at home, even with, uh, and my heart with, uh, with, with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. I'm sad in that probably he is like at home, like, okay. But so this could be, this could apply here. He's, he's at home, asleep, hungry, thinking of something in vacant or in pensive mood. And then he remembered this experience on the bridge early in the morning and then, wow. Hmm. Okay. Then he recollected it and studied possible. it and organized it. Recollected, okay, if you take recollected as such, possible. But recollected doesn't necessarily, doesn't only mean this. The, 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 the first thing that comes to mind is recalled. Yeah. No, I know that it remembered. No. He could have said, and I would be studying it. I'm not denying this. There's no... Such, I know like great poets always do this. That's why free verse sometimes, you know, poetry, blank verse. Sometimes you could write something and you never touch it and it's the perfect text. If you want to write, to write a sonnet, you sometimes uh, take the, the hammer and do some, you know, hammering here or there uh, in order to just make it smooth or not to, to indicate something. Okay, uh, when we first discussed the meaning of poetry, like this 
is words with and uh, definition was my least favorite because I did not really believe in all the whole spontaneous, spontaneous overflow of thought of thought and feelings. But at the same time, I remember like I tried to compare this with Arabic, and I remember in Arabic we have something I do not remember the term, but like when poets used to uh, stand in front of each other and start like mocking each other and satirizing uh, each other. But many people like, still do this. They, yes, but they wrote the poetry on the spot, and it like it is spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, and it is very highly structured. So I think that in Arabic it's like a more like. I don't know, it maybe because it's an older language and it's more structured than English. English is more of a modern language, so I don't think that it does uh, apply on these uh, powerful overflow. That's also possible. With uh, po If you are a poet, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you started writing more and more poetry recently. Uh, and that's why it's the best thing to understand poetry is to write it. That, try, try to write a sonnet. Give it a try. Tell yourself, okay, next inspiration, next revelation, I'm writing a sonnet. I'm sure it's not going to be easy, but it's not going to be impossible at the same time. If you write it, you'll end up, and we're, we're not native speakers, we're not Shakespeare, we're not Wordsworth. There is a possibility that he just wrote it, and he did nothing. Many people feel this, that the music is there, there is harmony, and some people would say, no, there is no harmony. Like when, when you, it, it's just try to read the poem for yourself uh, aloud. If you look at Shakespeare's sonnets, they, they mostly flow. You know? They mostly flow. Try to sing it alone. They mostly, with John, John Donne, for example, they don't usually flow. Because with John Donne, he, he you know, plays with the, uh, uh, the, the, the meter a lot. Not just, like, for example, with. We said, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves all have too short a date. Like, it, it flows. But with, with John Donne, sometimes it's, you have to slow. Even with the romantics, despite the simplicity of structure, sometimes it doesn't flow as it used to be because they have more freedom nowadays. They have this intention to break, uh, to break the rules. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it doesn't, uh, totally, but again, it attracts our attention. So why are you choosing, that's the question I'm, I'm raising, why are you using uh, the, the, the form of a sonnet? Could this be connected with the fact that he is in London? You know, the, the sonnet being, sorry to use this term, being repressive in a way it doesn't allow you to say everything, it controls you. And London controlling everybody's life, even the tiny little, you know, uh, uh, any, like things you do. There are so many rules, there are so many regulations in London, and that's why he chose this perfect form, the sonnet, to mirror this kind of relationship between man and poetry and man and, and the city, and man and London. Okay? And th at the same time, you could also uh, be surprised by the fact that this man is praising London. The, the meme I posted the other day, the last night, about this man saying, you know, my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. The daffodils are everything. I love them. They're the most perfect thing I have ever seen. And then he is saying, the city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare, a sight so touching in its majesty. Why on earth is this man praising the city? We said romantic literature, this is a, a core feature of romanticism. It's, in its essence, an anti-city poetry. A poetry, a kind of poetry that hates the city, that doesn't like, that considers the city to be the source of corruption, the source of depersonalization, the source of fragmentation, whatever you call it. So, go back, that's why a, a return to nature is a, fa a major romantic feature. Let's go back to nature, to mother nature. And by the way, the name romantic, at that time, they didn't call themselves the romantic poets or romanticism. Later, critics did this. And the term, at that time, the term romantic was used to refer to medieval times. To medieval times, when a time when there was less, there was basically no industrial revolution, no factories, no uh, steam engine, no engines, no pollution, at least compared to that time. Pollution, corruption, people were basically, of course, man 
was never good. But at, compared to these times, it was a lot better off in the past. And this, I guess, why he jumps over Shakespeare and picks a form that is also as old as this, you know, the, the, the medieval times. At times described as, you know, I don't know, like, like with, we, when man was not in control of nature like he was destroying nature at that time. And this also could be connected with the fact that he's using these words, uh, doth, if he said does, it's the per same thing, it's going to be the same thing, meter-wise, rhythm-wise. But he opts for doth, said he doth. And then the same thing with the river, glideth. It glides, if you add, the, this takes an extra syllable here, glideth. So river, glideth. He goes back. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with William Blake's uh, London. When he, said, when he, he was, expresses his anger that everything is chartered, everything is in chains, in manacles. Man is controlling and regulating everything. There's no freedom. Every, everything, even the river, is suffocating, being polluted and being controlled. So he's again jumping to the past, and that's why, again, the beauty of how to understand this and these are the kind of questions I want you I want to ask you in the, in the exam why is he using does in, instead of, of does why does he use the middle English form of the word glides using glideth is that significant remember we said in, in a way also poetry if it is the, the best of words in the best order this is a process of Taking choices, making choices, what word to choose, what word not to choose. It be, if you are a beginner, it, it begins as you know, artificial. You try to make the best uh, impact. But when you are a professional like Wordsworth, things naturally flow, of course, and will be more spontaneous compared to others. So we, we, we realize at the end that this is a poem written in London from a particular place, the bridge. There's a distance between him and the people, and probably the London, London Bridge here wasn't as high as uh, we can imagine, but still it's, it's in a high position. And even the timing here, at dawn, sunrise, the beauty, even here he's saying the beauty of the morning. Silent and bare, everything is silent and bare. So we realize that he's not praising London as London as such. He's actually praising London, a peopleless London. No people. There is no reference. There is no mention of people. Even when the word he uses the word asleep, it doesn't refer to people. The very houses and very here is, is for emphasis. The houses themselves are asleep. There's a personification here. It shows how peaceful this is. So th therefore, the, that's why I, I would take lie as a pun. Lie, to lie, to sit, or to, to sleep. He's lying. Let, uh, let sleeping dogs lie. Or not tell the truth. So this silent, beautiful, majestic scenery is a lie. Because in a minute, in five minutes, in ten minutes, in thirty minutes, it's all going to be again smoke and smog and noise and shouting and street vendors and raz 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 and tiny and these things. And then there's no peace, there's no quiet, there's no calm any longer. But what I find disturbing is the last line. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep. This is not real because seem. Asleep. Even asleep, it's just a short time. And here it's a garment, you just, something that you wear and you can shed, you take off, you change. And all the might, and all that mighty heart, I'm not sure exactly what he means by the mighty heart. Is it the machine, the heart, the heart of England, the city itself, the, the city, the idea of the city, the factories? The machines, yeah, the heart of the beast. But like, he's like oh, dazzled by the fact that the heart is lying still. Another personification. 
If somebody's heart is lying still, this person is dead. Again, if, if somebody's heart is still, if it doesn't beat, this person is still, is, is, is dead. But he's not, he's not saying, he's saying, wow, the heart is still. Like, people are metaphorically dead and life is good. I'm sure he's not calling for geno genocide, but still beautiful. It's very, very, very beautiful. We could, because we, all the time we talk about, like, for example, a place in Gaza saying, this is the heart of, of Gaza. And then you say, it's calm, it's silent, there's no... Uh, I wanted to say that a thought came to my mind, like he's, he's praising it when it's, it's dawn, so it is asleep because it was night. And night is not something that people have control over, so it's in a way or another also a part of nature, or like the, the type of that cycle. Mm -hmm. So he's maybe praising the, how powerful nature is that it even silenced the, the beast. London, it's, it's, sub, it's subdu subdued London, possible also. So again, and again, remember I said, always try to, when you read novels and short stories, especially short stories and, and poems, you need to understand where the poet, the speaker is at the time the poem is being written. So understanding that this is on London, upon London Bridge, early in the morning, gives this a different flavor. That's, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, I agree. Please. Okay, I have a question. Okay, now, do you consider this a sonnet? Because, like, I have not, like, my question is the... Uh, is this a sonnet? No, my question is oh. the subject matter is different. Is this a sonnet? Yes. 14 lines, yeah, Petrarchan, yeah, the, the octave, mm -hmm. assisted. It is a sonnet. And even but he changed, like John Donne, he changed. Remember we said there are... Many of you probably didn't see this. There are so many similarities between the metaphysicals and the romantics. Yeah, yeah. John Donne changed that. This is a sonnet. The sonnet, yeah. yani John Donne uh, freed the sonnet. He broke the chains around the sonnet and everybody else started to take the sonnet the way they liked. So thank you, John Donne. But remember the imperfect rhyme here? This could also be part of the fact that this is still, imp this, even the word majesty is not majestic, it's not perfect, it's not, you know, perfect, it's not complete. So there's still this tension that this imperfect rhyme creates, the tension that creates a conflict, that could tell us that this is all just a sham, it's just temporary, yeah. it's not going to live forever. This is not, but with nature, it's all the time. If, so that's why I say, for oft when on my couch I lie, the present simple, every time I lie, but here it's not the same, different. So yeah, I agree, he's not praising. There, there's a whole genre of poetry uh, called city poetry. You could do some research on this in the future. City poetry, how, how poets uh, tackle the, the, the city in different ways. And the most fascinating thing about this is, is when you compare between outsiders, like Wordsworth, he wasn't a Londoner, he was an outsider, and William Blake, who was a Londoner, who lived in London. London, in, in, uh, in, in London, if I, I can recall, he said, I wandered through each, uh, each street or something like this. He was Charted. in the streets, chartered street, exactly, in the streets feeling and sensing the pain, the woos, the, the, the cries, the, 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 the babies, the harlots, the soldiers, the blood, feeling it and touching it and sensing it. But this man, he is, he is himself. He's just up above. He goes to London and sees beauty. Many people will be revolted by this. Come, 
on. At the time, London, like, there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, hunger and diseases, and, and people were, were, were dying. This is one reason why the younger generation of the Romantics hated, in, in, in many ways, to some extent, hated Wordsworth, accused him of being an escapist, Charad, instead of coming face to face with, with the, the, or the uh, uh, you know, the, problem, the, the problems, the trouble, the pain, the suffering, he's just running away. Some people call them tree huggers, just making fun of them. Tree huggers, they just want to hug trees, and then all like their pains just go away. Are you, are you poor? Just come see these daffodils and you'll be fine. Are you, uh, you know, do you have exams? You can't, you know, you want to cope with that, the stress? Come to nature. This could help. I'm not, I'm not you know, being condescending here. This could help. And people who would, I would defend words were saying that this is, the, this is a, a, a revolution in poetry. Because politically speaking, the, the British uh, uh, you know, uh, government was really shaking because there was a, a rebellion, in, a revolution in, in America, a revolution in France, and they were like, oh my God, oh my God. By the way, you could read, there are so many uh, later declassified uh, reports because the English intelligence was spying on Wordsworth and Coleridge because they thought that those people were planning a, a revolution. And they, they were, but not the... the, the the revolution, the political revolution. They were doing a revolution in poetry, in language, in thinking and in sensibility, which is fascinating in itself, which paved the way. And when you compare this to, to, uh, to Shelley, Shelley is a Shelley, right? He was a man of actions. He wanted to topple the government. You are many, they are few. Uh, read, uh, the, what's that, the anarchy, There's a, there was a, ma a, mas a massacre in Manchester, and the, read the Ode to the West Wind, and even the uh, Ozymandias, mocking authority, you know, which one? Yeah, I, I, I too, but some people, again, for this, again, the thing that makes you love Shelley, many people will say, hmm, he's too political. I don't like poetry to be too political. So there's always somebody who would hate something about your writing or somebody's poetry writing. Poetry is about life, and politics is about life. Yeah, so yeah, about right. Byron, you should, we should read something for Byron. Byron was deliberately attacking, openly attacking, even naming Coleridge and Wordsworth in his poetry, not just alluding to them, calling them, making fun of them. OK, if you have questions, uh, here, just say something very briefly and we'll d just do the review for the whole course. I wanted to say that I think what happens between uh, Blake and Wordsworth is the same thing that's happening here in Gaza. Like, some people show you some good pictures and some fascinating pictures of yeah, Gaza. Yeah. When you look at them, you say, like, okay, this is Paris. This okay, is so, okay, let me get this straight. Well, uh, let's agree on this. Wordsworth is Instagram of Gaza yeah. and William Blake is Twitter of Gaza. Exactly. Okay, yeah, so with, with Instagram, it's like it's always beautiful, it's always. A cheesy and you know. Instagram steals from Twitter. Really? The funny thing is that when we see those people who give that flowery image, we call them romantics in yes, Arabic. Exactly. Like, we say that they are. Don't romanticize pain. Don't romanticize occupation. Don't romanticize suffering. Right? We do this. Okay. The thing is that both of them, or these bo both sides, or both parties, want to serve their own good. So this is the thing. Maybe their own. Yes, they're own good. And okay. maybe like uh, Wordsworth, when he wrote his poetry, he wanted to serve his own part of the book, the lyrical ballads that they wrote. And uh, for maybe like... Being self-expression. He doesn't care about the society. He just cares about himself. Exactly. That's, that's a huge thing to say. I'm not going to get into this because there's, there's a lot of things to, uh, to unravel here. Okay? So anything you want to say about Wordsworth? Okay. So uh, do you have questions? for the, the course, exams, anything, quickly, before we see la, uh, last year's uh, midterm exam. Words, uh, you said that there is a line that has uh, more than uh, And that line is in the second exam. So what does that mean? What do you think? You don't, listen, uh, 
I tend usually not to take sides. So I raise issues, raise questions for you to think and to adopt whatever opinion you like. I don't want to put you in a corner and tell you this is what you need to, uh, to do. Although, you know, teachers sometimes shouldn't be believed. Well, uh, uh, so yeah, out, out did the sparkling waves in glee. Eight. Continuous as the stars that shine. Continuous? Yeah. No, it's, it's continuous as the stars that shine. Okay. That's the only one that has an extra syllable, yeah? Yeah, and I In these cases, remember, it's either one, ex one syllable, one vowel sound is not pronounced as we pronounce it these days, or there is again a deliberate attempt to tell us that something is more extra, something doesn't conform with the rules here. <laughs> so this continuous, because he's reaching to the stars, that's a possibility. Okay. Possible, yeah. Like, like with glittering here. Possible. But oh, I, I, again, I'm honest with you. I could say the same thing about each line. Any line. Hmm. Okay, more questions about the course? Do you have questions for any poem, any text, any poet, any idea? Okay, we have a question here from uh, Noha. Excuse me. Could you just please? Yeah. The, the question that we raised like uh, minutes ago when we said like uh, about uh, spontaneous overflow, I think this corresponds with our the, the controversial question of is a poet made or born? So you can. Thank you very much. That's a very very significant uh, important. I think of this all the time. Are poets born or made? Are you just born a poet? And you realize at one point that, oh, I'm a poet, I can write poetry. Or do you have to study, to learn, to go to university, to attend classes? Of course, everybody's going to say both. But with, what is it? Is it more of this or more of that? Yeah, please. Some people can learn writing poetry through skill, but they won't be as good as the talent. Hiya. It's more of patience than having talent. Mm. If you have the patience to, to, to read more, to develop yourself, you'll be mm. very Is it yeah, like patience or attitude? Like, you know, I, I always quote Monica Geller, you are a poet and you know it. It's the passion for me. So this is an attitude. like. I think I can be a poet. I think I cannot be a poet. In our, in Arabic, in our, in our culture, there is a, uh, an Arab poet called Nabigha. I'm not sure which one of them. There are three Nabigha's. Nabigha al Jadi or something. Uh, no, I got, I got this totally wrong. Uh, somebody called... Uh, the, a man who kept writing poetry for like 40 years and was all, it sucks, old. And then at one point, he became a poet all of a sudden. And then they said, لا زال يهذي أظن الهدى لي حاجة بسمع لا زال يهذي حتى قال شعرا And he kept writing trash until all of a sudden he started writing poetry. So yeah, practice, patience, practice, patience, but significantly an attitude. Uh, look at the, uh, uh, the fascinating concrete poems you wrote. All you needed is just a push. There's a bonus mark if you, if you write this and all of a sudden you all turn into poets. <laughs> right? So you could add this to the list. Patience, attitude, marks. passion, practice, and marks. Mm -hmm. Or Lenin, yeah? Sorry? Thank you very much. Good writers are originally good readers. And good readers should eventually evolve. And that's why I thank you for saying patience. Because it takes patience. It takes. 
And sometimes all it takes is a good friend just, you know, to keep poking you and pushing you, giving you feedback. Sometimes, and that's why you have this beautiful friendship between William uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge. Please. Yeah. I forgot the name of the movie, but it was about how it, during his time, it, like there was another person who who kept working and producing music, uh, like yeah, making music for uh, for a very long time, and teaching in schools, and he reached like a high place in court. But then all of a sudden Mozart came, and he was way younger and way more inexperienced. And he was a genius, and he was a prodigy. So I, I believe that for you to be a, a, like to be a poet or like an artist in any way. Yes, you have, like, if you work hard, you will become, you will become... Uh, Eventually, yeah. Yeah, okay. but, like, you would not be as great as someone who was born with a talent. And this also reminds me, like, of Shakespeare. He said that he only went to a grammar school. Yeah. And other people went to, like... Um, but you know, basically, also for this, many hated Shakespeare. They hated him for the fact that... Because at a time, so, just to make this brief, uh, it depends on what school answers the question. For the Romantics... I think it's, it's some, somewhere uh, Wordsworth says a poet is an ordinary person in, uh, endowed with or bestowed with extraordinary sense and extraordinary sensibility or comprehensive of something. So it's an ordinary man with this inspiration, some kind of, you know. Now, for the, the neoclassicists, you have to learn the, the rules and you have to follow them. The rules of decorum, you have to be... Uh, well read in, in, in Latin, in Greek, in ancient literatures, so you can, you know, so you know what, what was going on and you know what to do in your poetry. So, and always people who learn, who work hard to get, to become readers, uh, writers, good writers and good poets, they will not be happy with, with naturals. And the same thing is, is uh, again, if you talk about football, Messi and Ronaldo, many people say Messi is a natural. He's a talent. But Ronaldo worked very, 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 very hard to be the world footballer he, he is now. Okay, more. More questions. More questions. Uh, want to, if I want to conclude something, that both of us, if you, if you take this way or take, uh, or take this way, you will, uh, you will uh, succeed at the end. This is the point. And the, and exactly. I, that's why I say everybody is a poet. There is... A poet asleep inside. Keep feeding him or her pizza, and you will have uh, a lot of poetry at the end of the day. It, because if you don't, again, if you think that, I know somebody who said, I will never ever be able to like to drive a car, it would be tough. So this attitude is significant. Mm. So some people are natural, some people work hard, and both deserve respect. And another thing, speaking about rhyme schemes and the, the, the meter, uh, I don't know if you were the one who said it or I read it somewhere, but it says that a poet um, can has the music in his head, so he basically doesn't even have to think of the meter. Some poets just have the music, they write it based on how they, they, they read the poem in their head. Well, but again, this is, this is a question I, I, I'm not interested in whether uh, he worked to tweak the poem for the rhyme scheme or it just naturally came this way. What, we, what I care about is that we have it this way now. And you can, by the way, if you are interested in this, you will find so many poets writing uh, the manuscripts. You'll find uh, first draft and second draft and third draft of the same poem. And I know many people who are interested, who do a lot of research on this. Like uh, with Tamim al Barabuti, for example, uh, you will f find uh, that the poem sometimes he recites here or there. Some, uh, like he, he would add a couple of lines here, he would change a word there, he would change something there. So people try to compare early editions with late editions and why the change is taking place. And is this related to how somebody wants? to work to improve the poem, you know, see the point? Like, 
when you change the rhyme scheme or something? Is this you improving the poem? Does it change it? Does it make it better? Does it? But again, we don't. Uh, we, we, I never said that this is a, a good poem and this is a, a bad poem. Yeah? Because there are millions of poems in English literature and we're studying only like 30 of them. So naturally we pick. And that's also bad in a way because we choose the canonical texts, the canonical writers, and sometimes other writers remain ignored. Uh, something, uh, uh, something else. Something else. Something else. Please. I think, yeah. Some people believe that modernism started with William Blake or color with uh, the, the lyrical ballads or the preface to the lyrical ballads. I do believe, and I have evidence for this, that uh, our friend John Donne is the pioneer in modernism. It was him who started this whole movement of changing the way, uh, not only just the way, everything about poetry. The sensibility, the themes, the forms, the structures, the rules. The man toppled everything, bro brought poetry down to earth, to us, to the masses. Poetry is for all, for the 99%, not for the 1%, the elite. Please. Doctor, we, we, we studied uh, the, the schools from, and uh, jump from schools to another school. Uh, do the poet or where they uh, know each other as, as the one school, all, all, of, all of them? Sometimes, yes. There is uh, this small circle. Uh, Poets, not, not every poet liked others. There are many things written about this. There's a, uh, a book called, beautiful book called Poets on Poets. Like what poets said about other poets. And there's uh, uh, Harold Bloom, who just passed two weeks ago, wrote this book about the, the anxiety of influence. Like, poets, all poets influence each other. That's why intertextuality is everywhere. Sometimes, even when you don't want to be influenced, you get influenced. That's the, it creates this anxiety. So sometimes, yes, they did know each other. They would, like the Romantics, Wordsworth and Coleridge were best friends. Uh, Shelley, Byron and Keats and... What's that other guy? Uh, Shelley, Byron, Keats. And Shelley, and even Mary Shelley. Like they were friends. They would meet regularly and they even with Frankenstein, the, the, the novel, it came as a kind of context, a challenge. Let's write something. So, yeah. More or less. Uh, my question is about the daffodils. Now, we said that Dorothy uh, was also with uh, was a company of, uh, of Wordsworth. And my question is, what is the significance of Dorothy herself like mentioning um, we're talking about a time when women were not believed to be as intellectual as, as men were. When, uh, when women were not considered to be poets. Like, oh, you, you could write prose, you could write your own diaries, but you can't write poetry because you're not a man. You're not, like this was still Im implanted in the mentalities of, uh, of women. Her text is really beautiful. In many ways, it's very vivid, it's very, uh, the, 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 this entry. But John, uh, sorry, Wordsworth erases her altogether. He kicks her out of his poem. She's no longer there. Some people would accuse him of being anti-feminist. Again, imagine yourself, if, if it was a dead body they saw, he's not going to go to the police and say, hey, I saw a dead body, I was wondering. And so he would say, my sister saw a dead body and I was there. Yeah? Imagine yourself finding a treasure or winning the lottery, you and your brother scratching something, and then he goes to your mom and says, Mom, I won the lottery. Or, Mom, uh, I found this treasure or something. It, was kind of You'd be, it, yeah. it is. It is frustrating. I mean, Again, some people say, sorry? It could just be selfishness. Yeah, possible. It's just selfishness. He, he, he felt that he is more superior than here. So why, why bring him the text? Why, you know? Some people would say, because he loves nature more. And again, I'm trying to imagine this scenario where, again, uh, 
uh, he, she's complaining to her mom, saying, Mom, he even looked, had a peek at my own diaries, and, you know, he j got inspired by this, because we don't know what inspired him, was it this? And he's, no, it's nothing against you, Dorothy. It's just I love the daffodils more. That's even worse, yeah? Right? That's even worse. But again, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, many believe that this is just uh, an issue of solitude that is a core romantic issue. The, the issue of solitude and imagination and individuality requires head out of the text. If you want to study, to take this as an anti-feminist, it, it's up to you. I, don't, I wouldn't say no. But if you want to trace whether he is anti-feminist or not, you need to look at other texts, what he does with, with, it, with them. Okay, one more before we see uh, last, uh, last year's questions. Please. The romantics and people later on. With the romantics and the modernist movement 20th century. Yeah, yeah. He's a he's a physical. Okay, last last year's exam had two main questions. Will be in a way similar to this year's course, uh, exam. You will be asked uh, to comment to write three or, or two paragraphs to contextualize. I am not going to give you the extract from uh, 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 the poem and just leave it open to you. I want to give you the topic sentence, the, the issue. Like this question with Shakespeare, uses the rigid form of the sonnet to control the un uncontrollable. Look at this. And I'm giving you this, focus on this. At least 80, 70% of your answer will be focused on the text given. This is significant to me, okay? So you could say, for example, uh, this, uh, the lines given is the couplet of sonnet uh, 18. Shall I compare thee to summer's day? This couplet rhymes perfectly, and each has 10 syllables, 5 feet. This reflects the rigidity, the strict structure that the sonnet follows. See the organization or something. Now, in these lines, Shakespeare is saying, I'm going to live forever. Because previously in the uh, lines above, he was kind of complaining that life is, life is not good to, to him or to anyone. Because every fair from fair sometimes sometime declines. And he wants to control this, to control his own destiny, to take things in his own hands by writing poetry. So life that is being uncontrollable is being controlled in, in a couple of lines by, by Shakespeare here. It's being squeezed into a space of ten syllables, two lines, perfect rhyme scheme. This could indicate Shakespeare's attempt to seek immortality. This is controlling his own destiny, his own life. He determined what will happen to him, not life. That destroys that, you know, the darling buds of May. Did he succeed? Definitely. He's bigger than life now, Shakespeare. And you can't ask Harold Bloom about that. If you look here, though you make up to kill me, let not to that self murder added be, and sacrilege three sins in killing three. What is a metaphysical conceit, and how does Don use it in this in his argument? Again, with special focus on this. A flea is you need to define the flea. This is a tire question. We have many definitions that you need to know: the rhyme, the rhythm, the alliteration, the personification, the apostrophe. The conceit, the metaphor, the simile, what other definitions? Uh, uh, concrete personification, concrete poetry, the sonnet. Uh. Uh, this is an extract from a poem we're not studying this term. Like, I look at the type of question here. Comment on the irregularities 
That's the focus. That's your key word. That's your topic sentence. Irregularities in the following stanza and relate them to the theme. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Bright night. Perfect. Eye symmetry. The first three lines have seven syllables each, but this one has an extra syllable. But look at the irony. This is similar to harmoniously in, in, in George Herbert. Harmoniously was the word that broke the harmony of the poem. Same thing here. Could, uh, could frame thy fearful symmetry. The word symmetry, which means symmetry and order and concrete and, and it's not symmetrical itself. Again, this creates tension like, oh, is this the tiger? Whatever it stands for, whatever it symbolizes, is this an imperfect creation? Is this about the industrial revolution, nature? And then there were uh, multiple choice questions. You know, the, the, uh, the stressed, the unstressed, stressed, so in the exam, I used this because I couldn't find uh, this symbol. In dance, in and dances with the daffodils, which of the following meter scans emphasizes the theme of unity with nature? We said the, the, the one with, when it says with, is stressed like this. And unstressed. Dance, it's the main verb, stressed. Says anything you add to the verb, unstressed. Articles, determiners, uh, functional words, you call them in linguistics, unstressed. So the only uh, part that emphasizes this unity with nature is where we, we say with, right? So, and dances with the daffodils, and dances with the daffodils. Number one. It's the opposite, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. And number two, what, which syllable is this? One, two, three, four. Yani st st stress, syllable number four. One, two, three, four. Hand stressed, mash. One, two, three, four, not stressed. One, two, three, four, stressed. One, two, three, four, stressed. So we exclude this and we try to make sense of this. It turns out to be which one? Yeah. Uh, it's and the line says and dances with the daffodils. It's D. And done. Unstressed, stressed. Says with unstressed, stressed. The da ancestors for dills according to virginia wolf uh, unstressed stressed unstressed stressed unstressed stressed unstressed stressed so and done says with the, the, four dills. Okay. Virginia Woolf. According to Virginia Woolf, John Donne's poetry, uh, such as the flea, empowers women, presents women as dependent on men, perplexes the minds of women, presents women as silent, meek, and submissive. The fact that the sick rose could have various interpretations indicates Blake's belief in. حاولوا تجاوبوا في عقلكم هذا عشان تشوفوا قديش تقيموا حالكم. 
the individual over the collective, the collective over the individual, anti-romantic philosophy, the state's duty to control public thought. Hmm? It is. In a poet could not but be gay, Wordsworth shifts from I to a poet because he was referring to his sister Dorothy, trying to avoid naming his sister, Farah, Khadr, W. Three, afraid people will say he is gay. He doesn't want to come out of the closet. Criticizing neoclassical poets. Sorry? What's that? I don't think this is, he meant his sister. It's just, I'm... Um, hmm. Both believe that, that's a question you're linking poets different schools. Both believe that a poem's content or theme should create its form or structure. Shakespeare and Dunn, the neoclassicists and the romantics, the romantics and the metaphysicals, Dunn and Marlowe. Dunn and the romantics, huh? The repetition of the same or similar sounds in two or more words, usually in the ending syllables of lines in poems, and songs. What's the key word in the question? Ending. Ending. Rhyme. The literary device in White's sonnet, fainting I follow, I leave off therefore, is? Okay, nice. In the opening couplet of the bait, John Donne subverts mainstream artistic traditions by employing parody, parody alternating rhyme, apostrophe, meter variations. Parody. The official institution of poetry attacked John Donne and rejected his poetry. In literature, this phenomenon is described as feminism intertextuality, literary movement, or framing. At least in these cases, if you're not sure, try to eliminate one or two answers and try just to think about them. To condemn Zionist alien rule over Jerusalem, in his masterpiece, Fil Quds, in Jerusalem, Tamim al barghuti invokes old Arabic traditions of gallantry and chivalry in the second stanza, openly calls for armed struggle, begins with a classical form, poetry form, and shifts to a loose form, shifts from a loose poetic form to a classical one. And that's it. Good question, please. Stressed. That? No, with. Oh, no, I'm talking about with. That is not stressed. Okay, any question? If you want to stay behind for questions, please do. Thank you very much. And see you in two weeks. Do your best for the exams. Assalamu alaikum.